Hi and welcome back to a new video. On my table, as you can see, I have the RTX 4090 Matrix, which is finally going to be available. So today is launch date and I already had the chance to look at this card during Computex, which was just a mock-up sample. And then also during Gamescom, they actually had a final review unit. And at like 11 p.m. I asked one of the guys if I'm allowed to take it apart and they surprisingly said yes. Unfortunately, it was 11 p.m. and I did have time anymore because I had to get up early in the morning so we agreed on that they just sent it to me and now we have full access to this for review today so we can not only test it but also in the end take it apart which should be quite interesting considering that this should be the first ever made mass production graphics card which is equipped with liquid metal. I'm pretty confident that most of you have already seen the Matrix from all the Computex or other exhibition footage and news articles, but it's still a very unique design. It's still an AIO cooled card, but the design is completely different. When it comes to the pump, at least what Asus says, obviously the cold plate because of the liquid metal and also the way they handled the entire connection for the tubing, which you, as you can see exits the card from the rear rather than on top or like the front section on, on top here and then just goes to this 360 radiator. I will now start testing this matrix versus the good old Strix. You have to agree with me that just visually speaking this card looks absolutely amazing and I think you will agree with me that you have to mount this vertically inside your case because otherwise it would be a waste. I mean the side is not bad either but it's also kind of a missed opportunity that the cable placement is still on here. I get why they did it because they just kind of reused the Strix PCB with some slight optimizations but the base is the same which means that the connector is also on here. But it would have been so much nicer having the connector on the side because you have to utilize this space anyway because you have the tubing in the way. This means you have to make sure that there is space. So having the cable on here would have looked so much nicer because everything else would just look so extremely clean. But still, I love the design with this frame and the way they integrated the RGB light. Just a very, very beautiful card. At least in idle, while everything else is quiet, I can also slightly hear the pump noise. But I also want to highlight that I'm pretty sure or confident that if you put this inside a case you will not be able to hear it because it's pretty quiet, it's hearable in an open condition like this, open bench, but inside a case it should be fine. Going over to coil wine, at least very subjectively speaking, it seems like Asus did some kind of improvements here because it's definitely more quiet than on the Strix and I would say it's on a similar level than the Founds Edition best case it's maybe a little bit more quiet than on the Founders Edition. But now let's compare the three cards. On the left side we can see the 4090 Founders Edition, in the center the Strix and on the right side the new RTX 4090 Matrix. The most important factor is going to be the GPU clock. And the Founders Edition is running at straight 2700 MHz. The Strix slightly above with 2745 MHz. But if you look at the Matrix, we can see almost 2900 MHz. And that's absolutely impressive. And we will also see shortly what this will mean in terms of performance once we look at the benchmarks. The memory performs the same on all three cards, but we can see bigger differences as expected once we look at the cooling. The Founders Edition runs at 71 degrees Celsius on the GPU and 81 degrees Celsius on Hotspot. Thus is the hottest card among those three. The Strix is running slightly cooler, about 6 to 8 degrees Celsius on average, but once we switch over to the Matrix, we can see that it definitely benefits from its AIO cooling with liquid metal. 53 degrees Celsius on the GPU and 60 degrees Celsius hotspot is definitely something I would call impressive for a non-custom cooled card. But I have to say I was a little bit surprised by the memory temperature because if we compare it to the Strix we can see that the Matrix runs about 10 degrees Celsius warmer than the Strix which was kind of surprising. Which also means that we will definitely have to check the cooler up close once we open up the card. As expected though, the Matrix will benefit from the 360 radiator and the three fans which are spinning about 200 RPM lower than the other cards. And that's definitely the benefit of having a radiator with a big surface area which leads to lower noise levels in the end. 
One more interesting aspect is the power consumption, because if we look at both Matrix and Strix, you can see that they have roughly the same power draw. And that's especially interesting because the Matrix runs about 150 MHz higher than the Strix. That also means that probably, and I mean Asus also said this, they are binning GPUs, because typically if you would overclock the Strix by 150 MHz, then it would definitely lead to a power consumption increase. That means that we're probably looking at a GPU with a better quality and a better bin. Now to go over to performance numbers, for a quick estimate we're as usual looking at 3 DMARC times by Extreme GT1. And we can straight see the result of the high GPU clock. And we can also see that the Matrix easily beats water-cooled cards such as the Inno 3D ones with 129 FPS. In gaming though, as you can see, the performance differences are quite small. The Matrix is about 1 to 2 FPS faster than the Strix and about 4 to 5 FPS faster than the Founders Edition. And to be fully honest, I'm pretty sure you will not be able to tell a difference between those three cards. Sheik meanwhile decided to sleep on my script, but it's fine, I can remember that this card has a stock power target of 500 watt, which is usually not used. As you could see in GPUC, mainly in gaming and benchmarking, you will use about 90% of the power target, which is roughly 440 to 450 watt. You could theoretically increase it up to 600 watt, but from my experience, it's just not needed. And even with overclocking, you will not usually exceed 500 watt unless you do modifications to increase the voltage, because most of the time the card will be voltage limited. For me, there's always this interesting take to lower the power consumption for daily use. In this case, we are lowering the matrix to 75% power target. As you can see in result, the clock is exactly the same as with the Strix, which means that we will also see the same performance. But in return, we are seeing a lower power consumption of only 375 Watt. That is a decrease over the Strix of 15%. So to sum it up, you have the same performance, but 15% lower power draw, which also means that you will have a lower noise level, because you can see the fans are only spinning at 1000 RPM. From our own coverage during Computex, also other articles, we know that ASUS is equipping these with bin GPUs, and that's also explaining the rather high clock stock. But what does this mean for overclocking? How much higher can we push the GPU? For some overclocking in gaming, I increased the power target to 120% in GPU tweak 3 and also maxed out the GPU voltage. With this, I could establish an offset of 170 MHz, which results in a gaming clock of almost 3.1 GHz. While this is a very impressive result, at the same time, it's also kind of normal for a very good 4090. In 3D Mark times by Extreme GT1, with this kind of clock, I could reach 136.26 FPS. And I have to say, this is the best result I could see so far for 4090 in my tests without doing any kind of physical modifications. But now let's get over to the very interesting part, I guess, because I really want to see how this card is built internally. And I mean, we see this sticker right here, which is probably a good indication that you should not remove this screw. So that's what we will do first. It's a bit more complicated than I expected. Those were easy to remove and the tiny ones on here, but these seem to be not removable. I'm not sure if there's just decoration, same as the ones on front. It literally took me five minutes to find it because there's a tiny hole up here where a screw is hidden, which also secures the back plate. Now here we have the back plate made out of aluminium that also contains some thermal pads that make contact with the back side of the memory chips so they can dissipate a little bit of heat and also the integrated RGB. This card is definitely not that easy to take apart and also like a lot of screws you have to remove. Already removed all of them, removed screws in this plastic fixture thing, also in the back right here, trying to remove the entire PCB now with the pump, but yeah. Not that easy. Over half an hour later and that was really complicated. Like, yeah, this card is not built to be opened. And what I found underneath is not great, to be fully, fully honest. First of all, let's start with why it was so complicated to open. Well, everything I did was correct, but you can see this frame around the GPU, this orange looking thing. And that is some kind of a guard that protects the GPU from the liquid metal, so that's all good. But this is also a sticky surface, which then sticks onto this plate right here to seal it off. So 
to make sure that no liquid metal will ever escape. That is nicely done, but I mean it's a big surface that is glued down, so I had to heat up the entire card to about 70 degrees Celsius roughly to then easily remove the card from the cooler surface. But what I found underneath, well, first of all, let's talk about the application of the liquid metal, which is okay-ish. You can see still some, yeah, some marks from the application, which is kind of okay because we can also see the negative of it on the cooler. So, I mean, it's not perfectly executed when it comes to the application, but I guess it's fine. We also know that the temperatures under load were okay, so I'm not going to argue about it. But why is this surface not nickel plated? It is such common knowledge by now that if you use gallium-based liquid metals and apply them to naked copper that over time, let's say after a year, it will diffuse partially into the copper. That means that, at least from my assumption, it is very likely that the temperatures will get worse after a year or two and would require a reapplication of the liquid metal, which is by the way this card is built. No way you can do this at home. I would absolutely not recommend this. Which also means that for ASUS, potentially, yeah, that is going to be maybe a bad thing. Yeah, just, just being fully honest right here, why is this not nickel plated ASUS? To talk about the rest of the assembly and also the way this thing is built, we have a huge chunk of copper to the left and the right, which will make contact with the VR VRM. But all the heat is dissipated in the center through the pump head, which then also means that the heat has to flow all the way to the center and basically also across this area where the memory chips will sit. And that probably explains why this design is why this design is slightly worse than the Strix when it comes to memory temperature. It's all still fine, uh, especially like VRM and memory temperature were fine under the load, but yeah, that explains the 80 degrees Celsius which we saw. I had to promise to ASUS Germany to not fully disassemble and destroy the card because it has to go back into some kind of media loop. That's why I will now carefully reassemble the card, also reapply the liquid metal, maybe also double check the temperatures. But yeah, I will not continue the disassembly from here. Just talking about the PCB itself, there are only very small differences. There is this additional chip on the top and those two chips on the right. Apart from that, only very small differences here and there, but I think overall it is pretty much identical to the Strix. We have different power stages and those chips are probably for additional monitoring functions because as far as I know, you can read out more information as with the Strix once you have this, the access to the software, more details about memory and for example VRM temperatures, but that should be about it. Did a fresh application of liquid metal on both GPU and the cooler side and will now assemble it. I quickly double checked the temperatures after freshly applying liquid metal. We could see a drop in temperature of maybe 1 or 1.5 degrees Celsius, which could be tolerance in testing and also mounting. So this was already good in the stock condition. To sum up the RTX 4090 matrix, the biggest problem is probably that I don't know the price and we know it's ASUS ROG and it's also matrix and both combined is probably going to be insane pricing, but it's also going to deliver insane performance because at least looking at all the data I collected, this is the quickest 4090 I've ever tested, at least in stock condition and even with overclocking it delivered. It's also running quiet because of the AIO cooling. It's also quiet when it comes to coil wine. There is a slight coil wine, but not to an annoying level, which is something I absolutely appreciate. We have this 360 radiator, which is 38 millimeter thick, measured with the fans about 65 millimeters. So you have to make sure you have sufficient space in your case to house this entire thing. If you have that space, then this is definitely going to deliver, but probably at a high price. And the only thing I'm not quite sure about is the liquid metal part. We know that the application of ASUS itself was great, because even after reapplication, the performance and the temperature was pretty much identical to our stock condition. So the application is good. But I don't get why it's not nickel plated, because looking in history, what happened with any kind of different liquid metal application without nickel plating, it usually led to problems. And I mean, we had a ton of those projects at Thermal Grizzly, so internally, historically speaking, yeah, it's likely that it will cause problems over time. Obviously, I cannot look into the future, might be different here, but yeah, 
I would be surprised if it's different, to say it like that. So that's the only downside I see, and I'm not sure why ASOS did not nickel plate it, because they are kind of an expert when it comes to liquid metal application. If you look at their notebook business, they are like 10,000s or maybe 100,000s of notebook they already did with liquid metal. They're all running fine. They use nickel plating on the heatsink, so why not here? I don't know. That's the only thing I would be concerned about with this card, apart from the price probably. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye.